My pleasure to introduce our lunch speaker today, Dr. Robert Hampshire. He's the Acting Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology at the, Universe, sorry, at the United States Department of Transportation. Uh, he was just recently appointed that, uh, to that position. He has a, a Bachelor in Electrical Engineering from the University of Cincinnati uh, math and a PhD in, or, in Operational Research from Princeton University. He's had a great deal of, uh, of experience, uh, research and faculty experience at Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Michigan at their Transportation Research Institute. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Hampshire. Dr. Hampshire, we're looking forward to your, your talk. Thank you. Ah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Roulette. Uh, and thank you all uh, the scholars here today uh, on a Saturday uh, afternoon. Uh, I'm here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, I've been a professor for the last 15 years. But since January 20th, uh, I was actually appointed by the Biden-Harris administration to lead uh, research and technology at the Department of Transportation. Uh, like I said, I just joined the, the administration and uh, I really want to thank again, Dr. Roulette and the, the uh, Transportation Center, Mid-American Transportation Center. Um, and also congratulations on the recent ASCE uh, Frank Masters Transportation Engineering Award. Um, so my office is responsible for, as you see here, all the research and technology activities across Department of Transportation. That in also includes the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. Uh, that includes you know, all the fun research about autonomous vehicles and drones and uh, complete streets. And, but the crown jewel of our research portfolio is actually the UTCs, our University Transportation Centers. And so we have approximately 41 uh, University Transportation Centers. And so in my, in my role now at the, US, at the U.S. Department of Transportation, you know, I'm in charge of really utilizing resourcing technology to support and lead on the priorities of the Biden-Harris administration. And those include, for transportation is always safety first uh, across all modes. So that includes air, rail, pipelines, but our key priorities, and this is something I want to kind of engage you guys on, to think broadly about transportation. So that's the theme is that for today's talk, if you want to remember something, is think broadly about transportation in ways in which you can engage in that in graduate studies. And so part of the priorities are COVID. We need to get past and you know, defeat COVID. And there's ways in which transportation plays a key role in that. Build back better. That's about making sure we come out of this crisis better than we were, with better infrastructure, with better systems. And when I say that, I don't just necessarily mean roads and bridges. Infrastructure also includes community infrastructure. That can, you know, include social infrastructure and community building. And part of building back better. The better part could be, you know, technology, I'm an engineer, and, but better is also equitable. How can we build back in a way to remedy past injustices that the transportation system has participated in and contributed to? Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But So the third priority for the administration is equity. And that's making sure that, you know, advance, you know closing the wealth gap, creating opportunities for underserved communities. And five, last but not least is the living up to our climate responsibilities. Okay, so climate change is real. Carbonization it, it, it is it's deadly. Um, and part of what we're doing at the U.S. Department of Transportation in support of the Biden-Harris priorities is to get to net zero carbon from the transportation system by 2050. And so that's the climate responsibility. Now, all those priorities are certainly interrelated. And so, you know, 
before we kind of dive in a little bit more, let me tell you a little bit about me and, you know, how I ended up <laughs> along this path. So I know that you all are at, potentially at a point, maybe possibly thinking about graduate programs. Uh, what would you do, you know, after you finish undergrad or even your master's programs? And, and, and so for me, you know, figuring out what to do and when I was finishing my electrical engineering degree, uh, even before that in high school, actually a guidance counselor told me, well, are you sure you really want to do engineering? Uh, it's really hard. It's a lot of work, you know? So I, I said, yeah, I want to do it. <laughs> and so I did, you know, electrical engineering at the University of Cincinnati. But when I was, was finishing, uh, you know, part of important parts about, you know, would maybe decide to pursue a PhD, particularly at Princeton, is at the time, in my undergraduate, I worked at many uh, internships. And those internships really gave me, a, gave me a feeling of the kinds of things I wanted to do. I did electrical engineering. At the time, I, I had nothing to do with transportation. I was uh, more interested in communication networks, the telecommunication systems. And at the time, Bell Laboratories, um, the research arm of AT&T, had a fellowship program. And I did several internships there. And then ultimately, Bell Laboratories paid for me to do my PhD. And the way in which I decided which program to go to is that one of my mentors at Bell Laboratories was becoming a professor at Princeton University. So I had admissions at other, other places. Uh, but really, for me, what mattered was having a faculty member who I knew and knew that had my best interest in mind. And so that's a key pillar for what I, I think about pursuing PhD programs is, or you know, continue your education, a place that's inviting, a place that values the contribution that you bring um, to the table. And for me, at the time, I was in electrical engineering. I did my PhD in an area called operations research, which is like applied systems engineering. So a lot of probability optimization statistics. Um, and, you know, my first week of my PhD program, it may seem a long time ago now, but the first week of my graduate school was 9-11. And I was in New Jersey. Um, not in New York City, but in that region, certainly across the world, there was, at that point, piqued my interest as well in public service, or at least trying to understand, you know, the role in which what I was working on could contribute to our, our country, but all more than that, like the community that I'm, I'm from. And so that kind of sparked a little bit of sort of itch for public service. Um, like I said, I was in engineering, but, you know, I, I want us to think about transportation in a much, in a broad way. And this is something I'm bringing to the Office of Research and Technology at DLT is in the UTC programs. It's really part of the missions that I've talked about, building back better racial equity climate will require and, and does require lots of, of different disciplines and perspectives. So that could be people who might want to be lawyers who are you know, operating in transportation law, or um, I would say <laughs> there's a lot of lawyers at the Department of Transportation, and many of them are in the civil rights office. And so that's an important aspect of transportation. Urban planners, uh, you know, you have, even uh, from the entrepreneurship side, we know that over the last few years in mobility, all the different, from Ubers to Lyft to many other ways, I think um, computer scientists are, would be really excited to have. Um, but even more personal human things like, you know, social services and social workers, because a big part of transportation is about connecting people to opportunity, but particularly you're underserved. You can think about underserved community, or you can think about elderly, you can think about individuals who are addicted to opioid and need to get the treatments. 
And those folks, a lot of those programs depend critically on transportation for getting people to those treatment programs. You can think about prisoners, and, you know, prisoner uh, exit and reentry programs, right? One of the key needs are access to work. And so there's many different broad ways I like you to think about if you want to pursue areas related to transportation. It's not just the traditional civil engineering route. Uh, I think there's a, I want us to think broadly about that. Um, you know, and particularly for, as we think broadly, I think the perspective, you know, that we bring, the, the mission that I bring as well to this role is about the role in which transportation has played in perpetuating historically injustice in this country. And particularly, I always talk about like, well, you know, transportation is a connections to opportunities. But, you know, for many of us in our families over, over the years, my family's from Mobile, Alabama. They moved to Ohio during the Great Migration. You know, and part of, you know, economic mobility has to also do with physical mobility. And, you know, what we've seen is, you know, historically, I always say this like, well, for the, you know, from Plessy versus Ferguson, the you know classic uh, civil rights cases that happened on a, tra a train, or you think about the Montgomery bus boycott. What was that about? About buses and it's about transportation to work. Uh, you think about even the Green Book. So the Green Book was you know for those my you know, my parents were part of this that when they're traveling in the South driving your car, and you want to you know maybe travel at night or overnight. There were only certain places that you can stop and stay overnight. But they created something called the Green Book, which is kind of like Yelp, right? You can say, what places can I stay at? So, I mean, I think in the history of, of the civil rights struggle, transportation has played a critical role. And we even saw that over the last few years uh, with Black Lives Matter, that many of the protests happened in the streets. Part of protest is also maybe stopping vehicles on the highway. Why do people do that? Because transportation is critical to the lifeblood of the economy, right? And so I want us to understand that there's a context um, by which we can do some of our great engineering and technical work, but also connect that to communities and connect that to a tradition. Uh, and that's sort of what, you know, one of the aspects I want to bring, uh, bring to your attention as well as you at this at this moment. So in my last couple of minutes, I just want to, again, just talk, think about, you know, the why and how of graduate school. Um, this, uh, some are like nuts and bolts about it, you know. Uh, I think, as I said, I wanted to paint a picture that, you know, there's some key priorities um, that are critical to outcomes of people and communities in this country. And transportation plays a, can play a key role in that. And that, that role is tied to a history of social movements, of opportunity, connecting people to opportunity, and um, you know, can play an accelerating role in, in, this, in the way that people achieve and, and focus on well-being. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know, thinking about graduate school. So one thing I a couple pointers that I've sort of taken throughout is, you know, for me, what was really important was finding a place that was hospitable, that had support for you as a graduate student, that you could connect with the faculty and staff. Um, it would be great if you're not the only, only one there, that would be a, a bonus. But ultimately, you know, it should be a place that, you know, supports a set of people uh, and maybe not just about the name uh, of a place. Because oftentimes I've seen places with really, really prestigious names and very, very famous professors. And it was just really miserable there for grad students. <laughs> uh, and so you, you can find both. You can find both a place that has really great faculty, really great place and the place that treats people well. 
and I trust that uh, the UTC there in Nebraska or one of those places. Um, you know, so for that, you know, it's important to find a place that offers mentorship, a place where you can build a connection um, with the faculty. I won't take a lot more time, but I will say, you know, when you go think about visiting the place or applying, try to talk to the other students who, that are there in that program and try to get a sense. Talk to the students when the faculty aren't around. <laughs> You know, talk to them both when the faculty are around, but also when they're not around. And say, hey, how's it, you know, how do you like this place? And, you know, do people treat you well? Do they connect you to opportunities? And also with alumni, if you can track down any alumni or people who have graduated from that program, what are they doing now? You know, uh, how do they think the career services or connections to opportunity work? Uh, you know, that's something that is critical as well. So in closing, let me just, you know, say that I think that you're, it's a really great time to be in transportation, uh, in my view. Uh, I think that we're at, in a place now when uh, this administration and the country, I think, is that we're debating something called the infrastructure bill right now. And, and that's really about building back some of the key aspects of infrastructure in America, that's roads, bridges, but also so social infrastructure. And I think transportation, and, you, and all of us can play a key role in that. Um, and, and part of that role, like, like I said, is historical. There's a narrative arc over history. You have, you know, giants like A. Philip Randolph, you know, from the Pullman Porter who did railroads. You know, Martin Luther King, the Montgomery bus boycotts about bus inequality. I mean, you have this, there's a, just a, many, many people over the years have fought uh, to have opportunity and access to transportation. Uh, I didn't touch on it, but you may want to look up something called urban renewal. That's, you know, when highways were created, the highway system was put in place and was routed through neighborhoods of, of communities of color, completely demolished, right? And so there's a, a reckoning for some transportation, but I think we're at a good place now to create and innovate to move past that. And as you're doing that, you know, if you're thinking about graduate programs, please consider, you know, all of our uh, UT tra University Transportation Centers. I'm pushing all of us in the UTC programs to be broad and expansive the way we think about transportation and also broad and expansive in the set of people who participate and contribute and lead in transportation. And that's that's all of you potentially on this call, if that's the direction you choose to go. I just want to offer, you know, that feel, feel, feel free to contact me uh, at any moment uh, via email. I'll try to be responsive. You have great leadership there and uh, Dr. Roulette and team. And I just really wish you the best of luck in your endeavors and, and hope you, if you make this choice, you find a place that nurtures you, but also a place that you can contribute to as well that you can contribute to your communities and live out, you know, and do innovation and really great science and engineering, or if you choose something more broader than that. So with that, I just really want to thank you. And hopefully we have some time uh, for a few questions or, or dialogue. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, and we do have time for questions. So if, if anyone has any questions, please feel free. I have. A, ex, I'm That's sorry. Um, my question is: um, You a very in a um, a big role, and congratulations on your new role. Um, I want to know what are some things, or what are some methods that you use when you are um, when you are trying to be creative in your mm. role, your position. And aside from that, when other people may not see your vision, but you see mm -hmm. it, so like how are something, what are you able to make other people see it, how you see it? What, what is your route there? Yeah, so thank you, Javon. Um, 
And by Giovanni. the way, okay. thank you. Uh, you were cutting out a little bit, but I heard you ask about how do you be creative in some of the mission. And then the second part of the question, I think, was how do you convince other people of that okay. vision? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I think that um, for the creativity part, I'll take that first. You know, I, um, I, I don't know. I, I read a lot and I read broadly, uh, not just the technical things I read, but also history. So, you know, I, I read very widely and I think that helps with in, in particularly history too, to get a, try to generate some new ideas. Cause that's part of, you know, doing a PhD, you know, you're going to generate and do something new that other people haven't done before. Um, and as far as convincing other people of, of a vision, I think that one thing I like to do is enlist other people. So I go in and I don't claim that I know everything. I have a sense of where I want to lead people, but I want to listen, you know, and, and really then let other people come to the same idea that I created. So I, <laughs> I listen and then just kind of guide them along to hopefully they end up where I am, but also maybe I learned something and, and, and modify the vision. So I think I, I like to listen and then that's sort of my way of convincing too, because if someone comes to the idea themselves, then they become more vested in it. They're like, oh, that was a great idea. <laughs> you know, and I say exactly. So that's sort of one approach. Um, I see some other uh, questions. Any who's next? I have a general question. And I, am you, this is, uh, Chimba in, I am uh, Dr. Chimba, Associate Professor in Civil Engineering at an SS State. Uh, do you think that you guys are going to have a UTC in the uh, near futures uh, proposals? And uh, do you guys have any category for maybe like uh, minority universities like HBCUs, maybe? Because sometimes we just compete with the big universities and become a little bit disadvantaged. So maybe you're going to have a anyway, category for maybe FBCU, for UTCs, maybe something like that? <laughs> good. Very good. I, I thought this session was for students, but I'll also <laughs> answer this question because I know this is an important question. Yes. Uh, and the next reauthorization that's happening, you know, the reauthorization expires in September. We are... Uh, Proposals now to at least at least double the participation of HBCUs, yeah. and possibly we have we're proposing to have uh, some HBCUs must be the lead. Okay, and so that's uh, there's no promises there, but that's a proposal that's that's uh, on the table that we created um, that's under consideration now. We know that there's at least two HBCUs that are leads right now. Uh, there's participation of from others, but I, we want to at least double that or increase it. So thank you for that question. Thank you. I do have a question. Uh, <clears throat> um, so I, you, I, you did mention, um, you know, with the Biden-Harris administration that y'all's goal is to have, I believe, zero car carbon by 2050. So what are the necessary steps or what are you trying to implement um, within your term to make sure that y'all reach that goal? Great question. Uh, so you'll see, I don't want to get too far ahead of our secretary of the president, but on their campaign trails, they've announced, you know, electrification strategy for electric vehicles and charging networks. So certainly electric vehicles are in that path, the critical path um, to net zero decarbonization, but also that electricity, as we know, must be come from clean sources. So that's, you know, together with our partners in utility industry, power utility industry to decarbonize and uh, provide more renewable support for power generation is part of the story as well. Um, but we're also taking a full life cycle approach. So we know that, you know, building uh, vehicles, construction on roads, road construction, if you think about all the cement that's created, I mean, that's asphalt that's laid, that has tremendous carbon output. And, you know, uh, when you creation of, of asphalt and cement. So there's roles, uh, has to do with materials as well. Uh, since uh, I started at DOT January 20th, we've restarted 
uh, something called the Climate Change Innovation Center within the Department of Transportation as a clearinghouse for innovation um, within the Department of Transportation. So that's one initiative that we've started uh, since we uh, got into office. So, Chief, Robert, that's it. it. Thank you. I see Eric, uh, Dr. Jones. Yeah, I, Robert, I, I didn't want to, I want the students to ask questions too, but I, I'm going <laughs> to, 24 just came through and I'm, 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 I'm pushing for more graduate. You know, I used to run the GRP program in itself. Mm. I really think DOT could put a lot more graduate funds for grad, for kids in urban and transportation. And, and I'm going to push out for the money because I, I know yeah. the big issue is we can talk all this good game, but if we could get more funds for graduate students <clears throat> of color uh, into urban renewal infrastructure sustainability, I think it's going to make a huge impact. And I, I'm stating the obvious, but I wanted to kind of state it. <laughs> no, that's great. No, it, it, you're saying uh, above and beyond UTCs or you're saying embedded inside? Yeah, I think the UTCs are, are an attraction. They bring it to it, but at the end, end of the day, there's no specific pipeline for the UTCs. It's a supplement to UTCs. I think it should be kind of, you know, we're, we're, we're this program here. I think we we envisioned this in 2010, Judy and I and and, and Larry and, and and Stephanie Adams, and part of it was we would love to have given out scholarships for those who actually qualified directly to oh. the urban renewal transportation. So it's something I think if you can direct connection, because at the end of the day, a lot of our yeah. students, you know, they're on the bubble, and if there's the yeah. money's not there, their parents are telling them to get a job, right? Yeah. So. Just my thoughts. Thank you. I didn't want to dominate. No, that's great. That's great. Let me just push you one more. So at the at the undergraduate level or is it also? The, uh, the, the pipeline, if they don't get it by their junior, senior level and get access to going to graduate school, they're going to go get a job. Yeah. And, um, and so I think that right now we're leaving a lot of talent on the field, specifically urban planning um, and also transportation, because right now it's a it's a hybrid field. And without that funding, people either go into civil or they go into operations research, industrial engineering. Without right. those hybrid fields, they're not as attractive without the funding directly right. into tying to sustainability. You're an OR guy, so you kind yeah, of know. I'm OR guy. Yeah. yeah, I know what you, thank you for that. that thank you. We'll, I'll, I'll follow up on that, thank you. Um, uh, I have a question in regards to your new role. Yeah. Um, how do you go about balancing um, what you know is ethically and morally correct and balancing out like the political side of it. And also, are there like any fellowships or anything within your office? That's kind of leapfrogging up to Dr. Jones's question. Yeah, <laughs> great, great question. Drexel, so where, where are you uh, What the uh, university are you at? Uh, Southern University in Baton Rouge, Okay, Louisiana. okay. that's fine. Um, the first part, the question, the balancing the sort of the ethical and political, you know, I'm, this is my first time in government. I've been a professor for 15 years. And I think I, for now, it's been two months in, I've joined in a time where the alignment of my values and what we're trying to do within the Department of Transportation are very aligned. And so I, right now, I don't feel, I mean, this is not like the equity story that I, that, we, that background I mentioned. It's not something like I'm doing on the side. This is like the job. And within the DOT from the secretary to the policy, the deputy secretary, this is, you know, this is the mission. And, and so, uh, you know, and so that I'm very aligned on that. And all the folks, the folks in the leadership that I'm working with are incredibly aligned in that. So, um, Maybe it's just a great moment and it's just the first two months in, but uh, I think we're really trying to push genuine change, move the needle. Uh, the second part about internships, yes, we have, uh, <laughs> the answer is yes, we do have uh, various summer internships programs. I'm still quite new. I don't know the exact names of them. <laughs> There's, um, I don't know if it is Don uh, Tucker Thomas on the on this call. Maybe yeah, not. I don't believe she, I don't believe she is uh, Ro okay. Robert right now. But I do know that you, you you've uh, that you just sent out one of the intern calls. And what I'll do is make sure that all the students get that call. 
from oh, your uh, you. from there as part of as and we'll do that within the next few days. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, so we do have several, at least two different summer internship programs that I'm aware of. Is that one the one that is uh, acronym is Stip Dick? Is that yeah that one? Yep. Yeah, okay. okay. That's one of them, but there's also um, at least one other that I'm aware of. I just okay. can't remember the name right now. Well, uh, this is the VP from uh, University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Okay. We, don't, we know that the only thing constant is change. Yeah. So what structural uh, parameters or constraints are you going to infuse within the four years that you're in there that will foment yeah. whatever decisions or changes that you're trying to make towards this green uh, world yeah. that we anticipate? Thank you. Uh, what a great question. This is something that we're grappling with now, like how do we make structural change within the department, for example, let's start there. Uh, so we've, you know, developed a couple, um, like I said, this climate change center, and we have began to staff that, you know, with, with full-time employees and connected to uh, the existing laws and statutes. So at least it exists uh, and it's consistent with law. So that is at least one way to embed it into the structure of the organization. And us as political leadership, we're making sure that we're engaging the career staff who have been there and will be there for after we're gone in the training and education programs. So we're looking at the workforce development within the Department of Transportation to, to educate people on you know, climate change or ed educate people on you know, equity issues. And so that's mainly a workforce um, approach is, is one of the things, because um, we're well aware of that. And we, we spent a couple months, you know, <laughs> repealing the executive orders of the previous administration. So we realized that, um, you know, that there's certain things that are temporary or change. And so we are, thank you for that question. That's, that's something that we're you know, trying to focus on. Thank you. Great question. Anyone else have any questions? <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, I have one more question in regards to the, um, the carbon emissions plan. Mm. Uh, this is kind of like a structural plan, but um, what are you guys doing just like to make sure that the things that you implement during your administration doesn't get completely obliterated in 12 years down the line, we're still in the same predicament. Yeah, I think that's similar to the question that uh, that was just asked. I think um, trying to embed um, things as the organizational structure uh, and also get engaging. Something I didn't talk about is I'm learning more about the federal government, what we can and can't do. It should and shouldn't do. Um, I think a lot of the these issues are really at a local level as well, like providing technical assistance and capacity and, and, and guidance to cities and, and regions on some of these issues. And also learning vice versa. A lot of cities and regions have really started to handle these issues that we, maybe we can learn from. Um, and so I, I think part of the structural issues have to do with also state and local and really the way in which we interact with them because that's where most of the implementation happens. So that's one way. And hopefully people here on this call, right, 12 years from now, hopefully that's to be a lasting impact, hopefully. So. But I really thank you all for taking the time and participating in this really great uh, program, scholarship program UTC there and on the Saturday afternoon on Zoom again, you know, everyone <laughs> is living on Zoom. So I think I, I, I acknowledge that and uh, really look forward to interacting with all of you guys uh, going forward. I really want to be here to listen, you know, uh, and, you know, participate in, in lead this community and I'll do what I can to, to continue to advocate for UTCs. But more than that, you know, be it HBCUs, 
communities of color, students of color, rep, underrepresented students um, and folks. That's what I'm here. <laughs> it's part of my mission. So uh, please help me in, in, in so helping you, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So uh, Dr. Roulette, thank you again for having me and, and thank uh, all the participation today. Okay, and, and thank you for participating as well. And I know you're giving up your Saturday afternoon and, and we appreciate that. You know, one of the, you know, one of the things we miss in doing the, the virtual rather than in person is that if you were here, you'd have probably another half hour of questions where everyone sort of yeah. comes up to you afterwards. So I would again, encourage the students that, you know, part of the, part of the benefit of these activities is to, to get connections and, and reach out after the fact, if you have questions or want to follow up uh, Almost everyone you're going to well, everyone you're going to hear talk is more than willing to help. Um, I did get one little tidbit that that you may have caught in uh, Dr. Hampshire's talk. He said, "Well, when you go visit, go visit and talk to the students, and that's great advice." Um, I know when I was in your position, I thought, "Well, I, I can't afford to go visit." And and one of the things you're going to find out is that we will actually the universities will actually pay you to come to the university. They'll put you up in a hotel. They'll fly you up. And, and so that you can do these types of visits, you know, back when, once COVID's over, of course, uh, <laughs> that, that'll be back. So just a, uh, just a really wonderful talk, Dr. Hampshire. So thank you very much. And uh, well, Judy, I'm going to turn it over to you to give us our instructions for the, for the next yeah. phase of the program. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, before uh, uh, Dr. Hampshire leave, let's uh, use our chat knowledge to uh, Thank him. Or thumbs up, clap hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, good to you. All right. Appreciate thank it, sir. So All, All right. Welcome. Take thank care. You. Enjoy the rest yeah. of your day and weekend. Bye-bye. Okay.